I'm going to start with. Okay. I mean, we so, can hello. Just go <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we're recording now. So, oh, somebody's in the yeah. room. I mean, yes, yeah. yes. So, um... <laughs> Somebody's calling from within the room. Somebody is calling from within the room. Yes. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, virtual coffee author coffee chat series that I invented because I had all these amazing people blurb my book, The Mortality Shot. Please buy it if you haven't. <laughs> um, I have and, it. And, and <laughs> yes, but you got yes. And here are some of Sharon's books, Greetings from a Curly Leisure Place yeah. and in, or, in Ordinary Time. She has a lot more, by the way. So these are just a couple. And actually yeah. the one she, she's going to be reading from a different one altogether. Um, yeah. Which is exciting. And amazing. and we're going to be reading uh, a little bit from new stuff we're both working on. So um, because we have so much to talk about and such a deep dive. And only an hour. And only an hour. I am, We're going against protocol of me introducing somebody else. So I'm actually going to just hand it over to Sharon to see. Uh, oh, and in an hour after about an hour in, there'll be time for questions or comments just so people know if you haven't been here before, don't know the drill. So Sharon, over to you. Please introduce yourself. I am going to introduce myself. I have, I've never, I don't know if I've never, but I haven't introduced myself in a long time, maybe ever. So I'm going to just read like a dumbass from my own bio and here it is let me just get it on here okay ha huh. sharon mesmer is a poet fiction writer essayist and teacher her most recent poetry collection greetings from my girly leisure place which i don't even have with me right now but julia has um bloof books 2015 was voted best of 2015 there it is by entropy magazine other other poetry collections are Annoying Diabetic Bitch, The Virgin for Micah, Half Angel, Half Lunch, and Vertigo Seeks Affinities, Chapbook, Belladonna Books. Four of her poems appear in Postmodern American Poetry, a Norton Anthology, Second Edition, 2013. She has also published three fiction collections, The Empty Quarter, and in ordinary time from hanging loose and Mavi Ayanago from Hachette in French translation. Her essays, reviews, and interviews have appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, The Cut, The Paris Review, American Poetry Review, Commonwealth, and the Brooklyn Rail, among others. Her awards include a Fulbright Specialist Grant, not completed because of a head injury, uh, Jerome Foundation Mentoring Award for grantee Elizabeth Workman and two New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowships. I'm going to skip where I've read because this is already getting too long. She teaches in the undergraduate and graduate programs of New York University and the New School. During the pandemic, she completed two books, Even Living Makes Me Die, a poetry collection dedicated to 25 underknown women poets of the Americas from the 19th century to now, and a hybrid prose poem memoir called Metaxu about her adopted Mexican Menominee sister who died in 2009. She is now at work on a memoir called Black is the Beauty of Brightest Day about navigating a three-year post-concussion breakdown. That is my bio. That's wonderful. Just, and just, now what I would like you to do is introduce your, you know, your the, what you're going to be reading um, okay. from Bonami and... Uh, yeah. And how, however you want to do, whether you want to talk about the process before or however, just go yeah. for it. That would be wonderful. So Julia and I are both interested in hybrid writing. Um, and as Elaine knows, Elaine Lynch, my former student and current friend, um, in my new school and also now my NYU classes, one of my assignments is a cut-up story. And um, I instruct my students to cut up three works that they feel close to, literally cut them up with like an X-Acto blade or a knife and throw everything in a bag or a box and pull the strips out and make a story out of that. And one year when I was teaching this, one of my students said, okay, here's my raw material. Just show me what to do with it. You make the story up. So I took her raw material and I made a story out of it and I dedicated it to her. And it's called Bon Ami. I mean, normally we sophisticates would say Bon Ami, but um, the character's name is Bon Ami and you will see why 
he is named that uh, when I read. So this this is the story. I'm not going to read her fragments because it, it's we only have an hour. So I'll just read the story. Bon ami. And it's from The Empty Quarter. One sat in Athens. Blue clouds, striped blinds, cigarettes, legs stretched. Saturday was roughing round to a denouement. The sun went in and out. One's view of the strident Athenian street was compromised occasionally by a pre-existing pathology. Lack of emotion and the fact that one hid behind humor or whatever meant nothing, as long as one could bathe daily and partake of facials. Additionally, one had become a virgin again. The ancient painful ritual to restore innocence that one had unknowingly submitted to while suffering from dysentery in India had worked. And now, no matter how much one fucked, one was continually reflowered. The process reinforced the whole issue of coming up clean no matter what one suffered unto others for how many countless hours. One was, one was glad it got windy and the sun went in as it had always been one's most cherished desire to blot out the sun forever. A single file of carriage horses appeared in the street below, supporting the figure of the elderly gentleman known locally as Bonami. Bonami alighted lightly and paused in the porch. One placed one's scented handkerchief in one's bosom and descended the staircase. The bell, the calling card placed in the tray, the stepping in politely, the yellow bars of the blinds on the stucco walls produced a perfect illustration of stasis and malaise. One made the tea quickly and the familiar feeling of an insufficient lunch was upon one. Returning, one found Bonami suit already neatly folded and one's legs already straddling the overturned bureau. The bad champagne and quiet, dirty talk and broken English accumulating to a dew point lacking any freshness. One squeezed and squeezed and succeeded in temporarily emasculating Bonami. One was paid $2,000 American. Everything was outside of time, so nothing mattered one way or another except that it was raining. One knew that as soon as Bonami left, one would write a story for the fans back home, in which some little girl pees on some old man, thus externalizing the presence that had inflected one with its dark fact of demonic possession since the days one was 10 years old and tied up in a closet by one's mother while she went out and had a good time on New Year's Eve with some fake cowboy. One decided to do an interpretive lap dance for Bon Emmy, enacting the disappearance of the sun. One kept one eye on the clock and the other on the, fig on the fingers that stroke one's private parts, Bon Ami's favorite parts. Bon Ami went neither forward nor backward nor moved even incrementally for hours. The phone rang. The sink sweated bullets. The sun came back. One begged Bon Ami to do various things until the impossibility and insipidness of everything finally caught one's annoyance and the lack of affect produced the sensation of a voluptuous sexual politic only possible in Athens. Bon Ami finally satisfied one by acknowledging briefly one's begging by focusing distracted attention on one's secondary sexual characteristics until one came. Afterward, one amused oneself by making a memory dog of various dinnertime triumphs, wherein one acted so cruelly, one made good friends cry, particularly in small restaurants where other diners would have no choice but to notice. One imagined a similar scenario for the upcoming evening and wondered who one could call because one had already alienated almost everyone. One's real personality finally made a rare appearance. Having been stored too long in a steamy diner, famous, famous for its smell of gin and fried liver, it was occasionally unavailable unto one. Its sudden appearance all, was always triggered by the long-term effects of the ceremony that restored innocence, causing one's breasts to transmogrify, instigating a pure bodily response that heightened the sunny conditions in the parlor and Bon Ami's attentions. One decided one loved Bon Ami. Thus, one allowed Bon Ami to squire one around the agora for a while. 
However, Bone Emmy had no way of knowing that anything of significance was happening as everything was happening underneath understanding and that one knew was the crux of all one's problems with others. The ability of the general public to intuit what was going on in one's psyche was severely limited. Like rugs or doves or vases, one was always the eternally observed. And people like Bon Ami, the eternal observers. And that was how the whole thing always worked itself out. Although sometimes there were problems when people like Bon Ami got the roles confused so that it was so that it was one's duty to keep the status quo going for one's own protection. One decided to put on the characteristic petulance guaranteed to move things along. One knew that every single particular had to be jiggled toward the Bonami event passing and becoming history. Bonami was so bold as to make inquiries regarding where to meet next. In God, one sneered. I am yours in Christ, Bonami said in all serious. But on the earthly plane, like a lobster, in exile, in a tank, full of other lobsters, in a grocery store. Whatever, one countered. One didn't give a flying goddamn. It. It's so amazing. It's such Thank a brilliant you. cut up. I love it so much. Um, this was this was written during the time when genderless pronouns were right. used by people. And when because one is the pronoun for the yes. self. And whenever people used to read this, they would either get angry and one person actually told me they <laughs> were nauseous because they couldn't as assign a gender to that character. And wow. I thought that was very interesting. I must have written this in like 2002 or 2003. And right. it, the reaction was very different back then. <laughs> That's so interesting. Wow. Now you will introduce yourself. I will, but first I want to ask you a question about this. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, that's <laughs> you can't all right. just move over to me that fast. Um, no, but thanks. So I'm used to cut ups, like the cut, you know, the cut ups I've learned to do myself that help and and not there's millions of ways of doing them as as definitely are. And and I've also then morphed them. So I'm just curious because I have read the fragments. I know you're not going to read them. <clears throat> So the, the cut-ups I'm aware of are the more Dada-esque, you know, like you cut the actual words and you move, but you've done something else where it's kind of like you riffed off of the fragments. Is that a good way of putting it? Or what, you how did you? It. Hi, Pamela Grossman. You can do <laughs> it any way you want. Yeah. Um, I've done, I've done cut-ups. I mean, I probably most of my older poems are cut-ups. Right. Um, I've done them that way. I've done them very sort of more improvisationally but for some reason I was that's how I felt about this story I don't I, I don't know why some of them are not that cohesive some mm -hmm. of them are much more you know you know just um jumping around but this one just happened to be that way you know right I don't teach people um Elaine Lynch can attest to this I don't teach people to do them any one way but that's just right. the way this, this one kind of came to me Right. No, it's really interesting because what I love about cut ups and that vibe is that it ends up getting into this kind of subconscious, for lack of a better word, but kind of like a collective subconscious, if that makes sense. I, it, more than a collective unconscious, actually a collective subconscious. It's kind of this thing that, you know, and, and by the time we're with the lobsters, I'm just so with you. I mean, I'm with you. And what's interesting is at first it's like my, my experience of it is like, I'm listening and I'm kind of there and I know because I know the technique. So I'm, I'm with you. But then as it keeps going, it just gains it, sort of this accretion of emotional content. And what I love about all your writing, and I, I think I've said this on the little notes, is, is that both it's hilarious, but also really moving. Like there's something oh, okay. really moving underneath it all. So it can anyway. So I Thank just wanted you. to say that. <laughs> and then I will now introduce myself since you asked. So I am a writer <clears throat> and I'm actually going to put uh, at Sharon's suggestion um, the, the link. Yes, <laughs> actually what I'm going to do is just put the link to my um, my website because right at the home page you can see a link to, um, to uh, the book. Um, so uh, it's and you probably already have been there if you were 
looking at events. So I started writing with cut ups. So that's the interesting thing. I kind of tricked myself into writing because I had been I had grown up with uh, a lot of writers around as as uh, my mother, who is here, can attest <laughs> though she also is not one of them. But there were a lot of writers around and they were taking up a lot of airtime. And then I married one who also took up a lot of airtime. Big mistake. <laughs> but we won't go into that. We but won't anyway, talk, <laughs> we won't talk about that 12 years that's of my why life. I married, I'll never get back. That's why I married a cartoonist. Very wise, very wise. <laughs> and very great cartoonist who has cartoons in the New Yorker, by the way. Anyway, so <laughs> so um, I did this. So I started that and I actually did it as part of a theater lab because I wanted to uh, have some text. And I was sick of working with other writers at that point and, and them getting upset when I wanted to do with their text. So I'm like, well, if I create my own text, I'm not going to get upset with what I do with the text. And so I created it kind of as a template. And the first ones that I created were um, from a similar to this in that people brought, we t- we're looking at gender, uh, class, and uh, gender, class, and religion in America in the late 90s. Because at that time, like, there was no idea American had a culture, like culture was everywhere else, and somehow we were just a blob. And so it was to look at what, <laughs> what was actually creating us, you know, and what was the gods of now. And people brought in articles and then we brought in our first memories of all that. And that's how I created my first cut up. And I'm actually going to in the last thing we read, which is part of our newest projects, I, I, I will do a tiny bit of that. So that led to stage texts, which led to a theater company, which led to going to London and being a PhD and then coming back. And then I've been doing more prose. And so the co- the combination of all of that is in the mortality shot, which is a combination, as you know, of stories and essays and a stage text, which I, my stage texts are something I'm more used to. And they, they are, even though they're not technically cut ups in the traditional way, I'm sort of cutting up myself, as you know, again, because you've read it. So you know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to read this now. Um, Julia, because, do you want yeah. to read? Do you want to read the text on the right, on the left side, and I can read the text on the right side? That might well, be a fun way to uh, do it. We could, except there's text in the middle as well. Oh so yeah, that doesn't true. quite work that yeah. way. So I think I'm just going to do do my best. Actually, you know okay. what though? No, you know what? I think this is going to. What I do, do usually is improvise. So if you go to page eighty-one, okay, if you go in the book, all right. So um, so where was I going to start? Um, so, all right, so let's actually, let's just start at the bottom of 80, because this will go into all the other stuff we're going to be talking about later. Mm -hmm. So, so from the stroke is what started at seven years earlier, and we'll just improvise about who says what line next. Let's just have some fun for a couple pages, and I'll tell you where we'll stop. So, okay, the stroke is what started it seven years earlier. And you now with the TIA and wondering, will that be me at 64? Which is incidentally seven years from now. That's that, creepy. Yes. Or I'll learn from this and live my life. Or will I learn from this and live my life? Will I take off and travel the world the way it was meant to the year he had his stroke and it all fell apart? Yes, you see now. I am mortal. She is mortal. We are all mortal. So, so there's no time wait, to waste. Time. <laughs> you know that. Have known that since he died, the one who really cared for you when you were little, even though he had no official role over 20 years ago. In the before times. Before the bombings. Before the planes flying into buildings. Before all that. And when you felt you were falling as if the floor had caved in beneath you like a trick trap door and you thought, I will never never waste anyone's time ever ever again. No time to waste. No time. To waste. No time to waste. The body keeps the score. Yes, but one must listen carefully. Part of the score is it dies. She read dies as itches when typing her impossible to read handwriting, just FYI. And she remembers a friend telling her that when her grandmother turned 100 and she was asked what being that old was like, she said, it itches, which as she's healing, she realizes the wisdom of the sentiment because damned if it doesn't itch, that is. The body. It works beautifully and heals itself and does amazing things right until it can't anymore. 
And this knowledge adds clarity. The Buddhists were right. Any waiting around for the right time or whatever seems foolish. But there is the heaviness. The depression, the inability to move. That too. The grieving. For it all. I read I, gray. But I meant grieving. grieving. Oh, oh well. well. <laughs> the gray for it all. That too. The gray hairs. She read her. She read hurts instead of hairs. Allowing them in. Not sure I like it. But there it is. We're all stuck here with ourselves. Hair graying. Getting longer. Doing what it does. Wondering when are we allowed out? And you know, of course, many are already out. Many don't give a shit. Or have to be. Out that is. Or whatever. The jokes don't seem funny anymore, do they? Excruciatingly long, embarrassed pause. Depression? Or is it just, you know, depressing? Reading about a famous poet now. You know, the one that committed suicide? Which one? Yes, there are so many. But she, hers, it seems so circumstantial, you know? As in, maybe if the world hadn't been so fucking afraid of a strong female voice circa 1950s, then maybe she'd still be with us. And maybe if they didn't fry women's brains or they manifested a personality, maybe she wouldn't have been so afraid of going to a mental institution the next time. And maybe she'd be alive today as she should be with her razor dark wit and images that preceded all the famous feminists. And she should be here. She should. And also, shh, don't, don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Class. Yes. Ah! We aren't supposed to talk about that. Not in polite company. Not in, you know, art. Ah! Shh. Yeah, but Shh. it's not relevant. It sounds, it's, you know, whiny. And like you don't believe in abundance. Oh, just kill me now. See? You are way too logical. And not spiritual enough when it comes to money. Kill me now. Just kill me now. And you know, she, the poet, she tried so hard to fit in. To be abundant. To be a poet. To be part of the team. And it fucking killed her. I swear to God. Or, slash yes. Yes. Or, or I get it. I see yes. it's 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 maybe that maybe. kept her alive a little longer. Maybe. Okay, okay. okay. I see the point. point. She didn't play the game at all. Yes, yes, I see it. You don't need to spell it out. Don't we? Well, okay then. Maybe if she hadn't played the game. Then she would have been sidelined even earlier and gone under earlier. And instead of being a failed suicide early on, she could have succeeded. And we would never have even heard of her even. And that would be worse. But yes, she should not have had to be writing every day through these headwinds. And no, they should not have been frying women's brains because no, that was a bad thing. Please note at this stage, she's looking around her desk and, and thinking how she has to clean it. Because let's face it, that's easier than writing about this shit in what is or was her father's birthday in the midst of her own depression and reading about a poet's life that led to suicide and wondering about all this. So cleaning a desk, easier. And we'll stop no. there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That was great. That we, <laughs> that should, we should take this on the road. Yeah, that definitely, was definitely. That was fun. You know, I'm glad you suggested that because it is it is really hard to read. Uh, there's actually uh, more than two columns and we were just really riffing is people can just, if you want to get a sense of what the, the it looks yeah. like, yeah, just to give a sense yes. of what, and also have a moment of silence for the guy who published it and had to format it. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I, I'm surprised he still speaks to me because um, yeah. we had to go back and forth on that so many. So yeah, so there, as you can see, it's not obviously technically a cut up, but I'm cutting up myself and then, you know, and then bringing in sort of what's happening and obviously Sylvia Plath and, you know, and, and just um, 
riffing off of the ideas that are going on there. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I think that we were talking about hybrid text and I feel like these are hybrid because when people read them, they don't quite understand how they would be a stage text. So because I came at it as a director, I already have ideas of how to do that. And I thought it would be a good idea to leave text open like this for other directors who might want to do it. But it's amazing how few directors actually will take that challenge. The ones who do, like Ian Hill is one who did to great effect, one of my total cut-ups. It's fabulous because they really go for it and don't try to impose a really linear narrative. Um, so, uh, you know, but but people look at it, they think it's poetry or they think it's whatever they think it is. So uh, it's very interesting. Um, and then well, I, have I, some, I have some questions for you about yeah, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you uh, I, I want to bring this up because we're going to talk about it later. Yeah, sure. But um, I was wondering, I think you wrote this before the autism diagnosis, correct? Well, actually, I wrote it while I was in the middle of it, because this was what happened is, so I'm about to get a diagnosis to see if I'm autistic, which is a whole story and what I'm writing my memoir about. But then long haul, co then COVID hit, then I got COVID and long haul COVID. Anyway, long story short, it just made that so I started the process in March 2020, and it took until April 2021 to get the diagnosis because they were also trying to figure out how to do it on Zoom. Like, you remember, everybody at that point was building a plane in the air, right? So like whether all the different health professionals, they didn't know what to do. And these these people were no exception. And so I kind of knew that and I was beginning to understand. Well, I did know, really, but I was waiting just to, the reason I wanted people don't need a diagnosis. I mean, they can know in the same way nobody has to get diagnosed gay, nobody has to get diagnosed autistic, but like, but it's it, in this case, it helps because when I'm gonna write about it, nobody can be like, you're just making that up. So that's why I just did it for defense purposes, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and also just to be, to be sure, because there is part of me that felt imposter syndrome as I feel about everything. So I was like, maybe I'm just making this up and being a little extreme, you know? Um, and they were like, no, you're really not. <laughs> it was so funny because I thought, I'm like, maybe I'm on the edge. It's like, no. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, I just you're thought really it was interesting, the thing about, you know, yes, she should not ha have had to be writing every day through these headwinds. Yeah. And no, they should not have been frying women's brains because no bad thing. You know what I mean? I yeah. just I thought it was a, a little bit prescient in a way, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah, and also because at the t what I've learned since and what I'm writing about, though it's not going to be in what I'm reading, because there's but is that how bad it would have been for me had I been diagnosed autistic in the 60s or 70s? Because, well, first of all, girls never were, but if you were, you would have been hastened to an institution where you would have probably just died and had your brain fried, had your brain fried, and literally right. they still electrocute. They still electrocute autistic kids in a place in Massachusetts. Still, there's a there's yeah. a whole movement called Stop the Shock. So the desire to normalize people, uh, you know, is just profound. And that's why I have my disability rights or human rights T-shirt here, because they are. And I, you know, I think I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of almost wanting to call my memoir Against Ableism. You know, I still don't have a title for it, but I'm just... Because the more I find out about it, and and it's just terrifying. And so, as I'm looking at my past, uh, you know, because it's very common that girls, especially who we mask anyway, right? No matter whether you're on a spectrum or whatever, girls are taught to mask. So we mask this as well. So it's taken a long time for people to catch up to female autism because it it just manifests differently because we're already like managed to death you know, from the beginning as girls, do you not have to have this feeling you can't do this, you can't do that. Even if your actual parent doesn't do that, the social around you does. Um, and that's bigger than them. So uh, it, there's all of that. Um, so yes, it is prescient. And it's funny you should say that because I didn't, I actually wondered it, until you said that, like, I, I feel so silly and it's amazing how you have a blind spot about yourself. Well, I have a lot of blind spots, I'll speak for myself, is that, uh, I've always wondered, like, why am I obsessed with Sylvia Plath? Like, why? And because I'm not suicidal. I'm really not. Like, I'm, this is not like part of my profile. And I don't I, I don't have the same things. But I've been obsessed with her. And I think now in retrospect, it's that it's just this sense of somebody who who is so different than her surroundings and was just so unhappy with the tiny, 
tiny little role she was supposed to take, which was so small and she was so huge. Big. So, you know, whatever you want to call that, that, you know, that's probably why. So it's a neurodiversity of some kind, whatever it is. I don't know. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to diagnose somebody in retrospect, but they shouldn't have been frying her brain. Like that much I think we can all agree on. It. I mm -hmm. hope we can all agree on that. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really good question. And honestly, I hadn't thought it because it's, Thank you. <laughs> but this is also this is also where you and I connect in a way, and we yes. didn't even know this when we became yes. friends. But yes. I talk about that. I have epilepsy, but I I didn't know. I mean, my mother knew about it, but I didn't know about it until I was twenty six, and I'm very glad that I didn't know until I was twenty six because what what would have been done to me if they knew that I had epilepsy? How would I, you know, I mean, I was a weird kid anyway. I was bullied. Yeah. How would I have been marginalized further? And, you know, and the drugs they were giving for epilepsy in the 60s were it just horrendous. Horrible. Horrendous. horrible. I had some friends, so I know. I, I saw yeah, what no, happened. It was, it was awful. It was yeah. horrifying and it was completely and utterly stigmatized. Like, I mean, I, I remember anything like autism, epilepsy, you know, any kind of difference was, was just, was just off the charts stigmatized and all of the insults, the kid, the bully insults were all about all that stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, so I think being, being different as a kid has always been really difficult. You know what I mean? But I think mm -hmm. if you have some other, if, if it's just, you're not just awkward, you're not just socially awkward, you've got this other thing happening. Yep, I exactly. think once kids find out that you have something, then it's, you know, then it's even worse. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I like to think, I kind of think, I hope is true that it feels like the generation coming up is a bit more hip to that. Now, I don't yes. know how, how, and I'm so excited about Gen Z. I'm, I'm a big Gen Z proponent. Um, I know people have a lot of I love to amongst say about my them. students. Amongst yeah. my students, I love Gen Z. Like they know so much about stuff that the millennials kind of like don't know about. Like in my NYU class, we were going around and introducing ourselves to each other. And the kids were asking me questions. And somebody said, what musicians do you like? And I said, I don't know, just name some. And some kids said T-Rex. And I was <laughs> like, oh my God, how do you, I didn't say this, but I was like, how do you even know about Mark Bolin? You know, I was just like so impressed. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's quite interesting. And then also with the gender stuff, like you said, I mean, 2003 to now is incredible. Like what's happened with all of that, like that was not happening. And that's the other thing about being autistic, by the way, is it, there's something called, um, autosexual or autosexual, which is basically, and I've always felt this way, which is essentially just not identifying with gender period. It's yes. not like I'm trans or something, which is, there's nothing wrong with being trans. Great. But I, that's not me. It's just, I just don't identify, I just don't fit into, and that, it's not like I want to be a man. I don't, but I also don't like the female thing is just like this weird suit that I feel like whenever I look particularly female, I feel like I'm in drag, you know, it's like, I, I just am like, okay, I'm trying to but drag and be cool. I'm, well, drag yeah, I mean, if you cool. go for it, it's fine. No, I mean, there's ways to do it. But I'm just saying it literally feels that way. I never feel like, oh, this is me and my essential femininity. You know, I like no idea what it even means. <laughs> wish the term androgynous would come back because yeah. that would cover a lot of people. You know what I mean? But I, think but, that would... but I was intimidated by that. And let me tell you why, because I have breasts and hips. This is the other oh, thing. Yeah. Like, I was so androgynous. Like you fit in your body type is much better for that. Uh, my body, I, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be androgynous. I'm like, let me be Laurie Anderson. Please, please, please let me be Laurie Anderson. Could I please be Laurie Anderson? Like if I was wanted to be anybody, it was, and I was so not not Lori Anderson. Like it was just not happening. Um, and you know, probably still want to be her, but like she's so cool. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it, it's that kind of thing. Uh, but so I, I, well, I agree with you. I understand what you're saying. I feel like it needs to also include whatever body types and whatever, because not be yep. like you have to be skinny and 
Oh, oh man, it was torture. I, that's why I had, a, I had an eating disorder when I was a kid because I was trying to be so scared. I was like, don't let that happen. Believe it or not, I used to be yeah. almost anorexic. Like, look at me now. It's like, I, ah, that. I was. That's why I won't the go boob, on a diet. When the, when, when the boobs come in, it's a weird thing. <laughs> oh my God, it's so awkward. Plus, and then girly. I know, exactly. And then everybody's looking at you like that and you're just like, what? Like, I, and it wasn't even... Cause like some girl, apparently some girls are like, know what they're doing and they kind of get it and they play with it. But I was just like, what are you? I just had no, I literally didn't know what was going on. I had yeah. no idea. Like Terrifying. other people would have to tell me like, oh, that person's checking you out. I'm like, they're what? <laughs> they're yeah, like, Why? <laughs> Why would they do that? So funny. Um, so these are all the things I think we write about, isn't it? Like, I think, I think, we, oh, so let's talk about, I don't want to get, because I want to have time to make sure we read our things. I want you to read, for, talk about your memoir and, and about how, if you don't mind, and, and what's going on there and the whole thing about what you wrote that essay about and all about changing the way you write. Well, I, I kind of don't want to read from the memoir yet. Okay, that's fine. I, I mean, I, I I have three pages that, I mean, I have much more written than that. I have three pages that I could read, but they don't make sense if I don't read all three of them. So I'm just going to talk about it. You know? Okay, go um, for it. No, that's that fine with sense. me. Yeah, yeah. So the memoir is called Black is the Beauty of Brightest Day, which is mm -hmm. a line from a Christopher Marlowe play that I've always loved. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about, um, uh, I had a, I had a, uh, I had a, okay, let me just put, I'll give you the background. I went to Russia in 2011 to teach on a Fulbright. And six hours after I got there, I fell in the hotel bathtub and hit my head on the on the por on the hard porcelain. Mm -hmm. And I had a very uh, very ineffectual program officer who basically told my husband, "Well, there are a couple of clinics you can take her to." And my, you know, it was like so. We called the paramedics. The paramedics came. It felt my head, you know, and uh, the one paramedic said, eh, she felt the bomb and she was like, you're yeah, my linky, you know, which means small. And um, I didn't feel confident continuing with this grant because I had to fly the next day, six hours over the Ural mountains to this tiny town called Orsk at the border of Kazakhstan. And I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do that with a potential concussion. So I did not do that. And I came home and I forfeited the Fulbright. A month after, I thought I was okay. You know, I came back on the plane. I thought I was okay. A month after I had a root canal and the drilling from the root canal caused a panic attack that lasted three years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a, a daily panic attack that lasted three years. And that was my mental breakdown that lasted three years. Mm -hmm. And I got through it and I'm not advocating for this. And I'll explain why in, in a minute, I got through it without any medication because I was afraid to, I was afraid of everything. And I was afraid to take medication. I was afraid to take Advil. I was afraid to leave the house, even though I did, I forced myself to do it. But all the things that I didn't have to force myself to do, I just thought, well, I won't do it. So I got through this heinous three-year uh, mental breakdown without taking medication because I was just purely afraid of it. Not because I'm advocating. I would never advocate. I'm on, you know, I take medications, you know, I don't advocate that people do this. It probably would have gone away sooner. So I'm writing um, a memoir about uh, concussion, what concussion is, uh, about uh, manifestations of depression. And I'm sort of using a prose poem approach to this hmm. sort of um my my inspiration for this is the undying by um ann boyer which is a favorite memoir of mine hmm. so i'm bringing all these um strands together using a prose poem approach but also very narrative so mm -hmm. that's what that's what that memoir is about um i just don't feel like i want to read from it because i i have a three-page essay that I'm about to send out, but it doesn't really address the breakdown itself. It just addresses um, falling in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. But if you ever fall and hit your head, I'll tell you, it takes, th you can wait like three months without a symptom and then you'll have a symptom. 
Yeah. That yeah. will last three years. <laughs> And so that's what my yeah, I'm I, I'm so excited to read it. Not excited that it happened to you, but I'm excited to read what you what you make of it. Um, and did you, you write? You mentioned writing an essay as well about that, right? Wasn't there? Yeah, I'm essay? writing an essay right now. I'm not done with it yet. It's just a but there was the the other thing, the article that you mentioned. Was oh, there, you're talking there, about the um art, the paper that I gave at the yes, disability. Yes, conference? sorry. Yeah. That's what I'm sorry. Right. I forgot that was a paper you get. Okay, so that. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> called um that's called Sea Monster in the Brain, Temporal Lobe, Epilepsy, and Poetic Experimentation. The yeah. reason why um it's called that, and I'll tell you, I'll just read a paragraph from it. Um please do. TLE is the most common form of focal or partial epilepsy, meaning that it occurs in only one part of the brain. Generalized epilepsy occurs across both brain hemispheres. 60% um, of people who have epilepsy have temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, and the hippocampus, it's called that because it means sea monster. And <laughs> seizure activity usually occurs in the hippocampus. Humans and other mammals have two hippocampi, one in each side of the brain. Um, this organ is so named because the 16th century Italian anatomist, Giulio Aranasio, it looked like a seahorse. Um, because the hippocampus plays important roles in the consolidation of short-term and long-term memory, TLE, temporal lobe epilepsy, often involves and affects memory, memories, and remembering. And I've often have seizures, I've often had seizures when I try to remember something. Mm. One more thing oh. is that when I have a seizure, I actually, I don't see things, but I have these visions in my head and it feels like I am um, unforgetting something, not remembering, but unforgetting something. And the word for mm. unforgetting is anamnesis. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never taken medication for the epilepsy because I actually find it very interesting. Um, <laughs> when I get these things, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. probably frying my brain. But um, I've never taken medication because well, I'm afraid of medication. So, and um, it's just a very that. interesting thing. Yeah, and also yeah. Um, epilepsy medications really do fry your brain. They help some people who have very severe epilepsy but sure. i don't so i don't take it because i just i just don't know you know and so anyway, how that, 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 oh sorry i'm sorry so, that's the you, article so i'm just curious how do you feel i mean i have some theories about it but i'm just curious like how do you feel that's affected your writing over time like what, what you know do you think that might have something to do with your partiality to cut ups and that kind of idea and that fragmented and memory thing. and memory based writing i write right. um i just finished a memoir about uh, my sister i mentioned it it's called metaxu and a lot of my work is is based in memory and remembering things and um i think that's that's also you know when i was in third grade and i started having seizures for the first time i had this weird sensation that like i was my head was at the ceiling and my hands were down uh on the desk and i could actually almost see it like that and so it like affects the way it 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 sort of um affects your preoception i think that's mm -hmm. called like the way that you feel mm -hmm when you're in a space. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, not trusting your environment or, or in, in a better sense, being okay with not really being there and understanding that things are not what they seem. I think that's the upside of it. You know, being, being okay with uncertainty and um, uh, things that don't seem right or are dreamy in some way. I mm -hmm. think that's the upside of it. I try to find the upside of everything. I believe me, I'm the same way. I, 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 somebody yes, actually I somebody actually refer, accused me of being Norman Vincent Peale-like and my ability to do that. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's really well, not the politics I'm memoir. trying to advocate. What? Sorry. Don't talk about your memoir because now yeah. we're out of time. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I noticed that too. Yeah, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is, um, and with apologies to people who are here last time, um, I'm not gonna read all of it though. I'm just gonna read a tiny portion. As 
might be the opening. I don't know. Just because I want to just bring tie back into the cutups, because I feel like what I forgot to say is what I realized after I began to understand I was autistic and I began to hear, uh, there's an amazing book called Authoring Autism mm. by Ray Yergo. It's an incredible book. And she talks about unmasked autistic voices. And and there's this, you're stuck in this weird uh, conundrum where people don't believe you're autistic if you have rhetoric because autism is supposed to mean you can't communicate. <laughs> <laughs> and, or, and so, or if you look normal or well, if you're yeah. high functioning you know yeah which is which are all baloney terms yeah um, but and also because obviously I don't like people think you do but they've always looked at you in a funny old way so I feel like my cut-ups and then which I'm going to read a little bit of it because I, I linked them into the very beginning are my were my first line of flight let's say you know mm -hmm. if you like Deleuze and Guattari and all those crazy French guys you know it's like that kind of idea uh, without knowing what I, I knew I had to get anyway let me just read this I'm going to read a page and a half so this will make it I sometimes feel like I articulate things better in my writing than my speech so yeah uh, so I, I invented a word that I'm going to use at the top of the thing called traumatism talk oh, to me that's don't nice. talk to me thanks <laughs> She knows she needs to tell you the story, but she does not want to tell you this story. There are some stories that are harder to tell than others, some that cost. Will you listen? Will you hold a container for her that's strong enough she knows she can come back, maybe a rope she can hang on to, some body armor? She wanted to tell you this story about autism and trauma and yoga and art without describing certain things because it feels like trauma porn, like some kind mm. of payment she has to make. I'm speaking about her in the third person to protect her in case that's not entirely obvious. Here she is 25 years ago, cutting up texts, knocking at the prison walls, listening out for a weak spot where it might give. I speak in language where I am nothing, closely linked to the point of view of broken umbrellas. I'm in the death of autonomous lockup. I'm in the death of action. Their theories, positing how long I had been there infinitely, no movement, no thought to just fall down. The marriage of true tension has disappeared. Our heroine now sees that my hoping for it has given a framework. There are multitudes, each one myself. You can see her almost trapped inside the cocoon, signaling, wanting out, not knowing how, so aware of the camouflage, the trap, the prison. She knows you can hear it. She knows she has to fall. She knows the freeze. She knows what it is to be trapped. She knows when she has to play dead. She knows she cannot attack this trap directly. How does she know this? Well, it's in part because of a story she's tried to tell in so many ways and each time failed. The words direct seem too frightening to share, also inadequate. You were able to trick her into writing, into believing I existed, even if in a language where I am nothing, closely linked to the point of view of broken umbrellas, where there are multitudes, each one myself. So I just thought I would read that little tiny part again. Um, some people were here last time, but to give a sense of how I'm bringing the very first cut up in. Um, because, now, how did you, I'm sorry, I, I'm really curious and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's oh, no, no, go. so how did you write that? I mean, did you, what did you cut up? You cut up your own work. What, what was your actual physical, um, movement, well, how you, well, this, the, there's a lot of notes here from people, but these, the, the italic parts, I don't know if you can see are from mm -hmm. the old cut up itself. So some of that, the things that sounded a little more poetic-y are the, the actual old cut-up, the very first oh. cut-up I did in 97. 97? Mm, um, yeah, yeah, 25 years ago, yeah. So, um, and that was the first one that I created with the, the theater people, bless you. And um, and so the she, the beginning, the she knows she needs to tell you the story, that was one of the hardest things about creating this memoir, and the reason I don't have a lot of pages to share either, though I've written a zillion words, is trying to find the voice of it, you know, and, and how to articulate the multiplicity of the experience of being autistic, the experience of trauma that also informs, and that's why I came up with traumatism, because it's where mm -hmm. they come together. Um, and there's the trauma of being autistic itself. Uh, then there's different kinds of trauma from childhood, 
et cetera, and in adulthood, frankly, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so the she came from realizing that I've played, as you've noticed in, in respiration as well with different pronouns and, you know, the she, I, you, and, and I've always done that with my writing, starting with the stage text. And I think it's this way of understanding, you know, it's not so much gender because I'm using she, but it's, it's the, uh, the ways in which I'm seeing myself and this I did this way before I knew I was autistic but now that I know I'm autistic I feel like in that kind of play is the is my attempt to have an unmasked autistic voice is where I'm trying to speak from there right mm -hmm. I guess I could write an entire thing from there but I feel like it would be very hard to read so I'm trying to also you know put things around that uh that somehow articulate uh, where where the voice is from, the narrator who is me, you know, it, that she is the most dissociated, you is kind of a back and forth, and when I'm an I, it's a little more integrated, but kind of moving between all of those, right? And then the cut-ups mm -hmm. themselves were using other people's words, you know, or some of them were my own from memory, but a lot of them were other people's words and cutting them in and, and get it, finding a way into words that way. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that that's that's yeah, kind of no, yeah. so in this piece that I wrote, actually this one is me putting together three different actually I didn't read the third part. This is more two, but putting together two or three different parts of the memoir I've already written into one piece. And I'm beginning to realize that's what I'm gonna have to do. It's gonna have to be there's like one voice and another voice, and it's not gonna be like, well, decide a voice. It's gonna have to be yeah. a way to bring them all in somehow with you know, without it just being hopelessly confusing. Um you're gonna need a good you're gonna need a good editor. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so um anyway, that's but I just thought it was interesting because of the overlap of the cut-ups. I just wanted to read that. You yeah. know, just in terms of the interesting thing of starting from that place. Yeah. 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 Should we take yeah. questions? We can do that. Absolutely. Unless, unless you have something else you want to say. Um, not particularly, not at this moment in time. If anyone has a question um, right now, you're, you're unable to unmute yourself, but you can raise your hand and I can unmute you or you could put it in the chat or a comment is okay too. You're allowed to have a comment. <laughs> Doesn't loud. Just have you, you don't have to like try to couch a comment in a question because we'll know you're doing that. So you can just have the comment. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't right. It doesn't have to be a question. You can just make a comment. Right? You can say something. Yeah. So does anyone have anything? We've stunned people. Or you can just go like this and we'll see you. <laughs> yes, one or the other. That's true. Yeah. So, but I need to know oh, if you. Oh, Glenn, 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 do you want me to let you unmute? Okay, you want to say something? Okay. All right, actually, I just made it so you all can unmute yourselves and that just makes it easier. So yeah. go for it, Glenn. You just have to unmute yourself though, because we still can't hear you. <laughs> there. There you go. All okay. right. Hey. Uh, yeah, in the, the story, um, uh, the Dragonfly Time, uh, I noticed that you were um, like every, par like one paragraph to the next, you were switching from first to second person and uh, you know it it seemed like in, in sort of the flow of the book it kind of sets you up for like the multiplicity of voices in the stage text but uh was that was that real deliberate just that uh flipping back and forth it seemed odd but it, it also worked really well like it didn't feel jarring so that was just interesting yeah, because it's kind of like, um, you know how I think most people, I, I, I know not everyone does, but you know how it's really easy to kind of have a dialogue with yourself, you know, or like you're remembering something and another part of you is like, but was it really that way? Or, you know, so it's kind of bringing in that, it, you know, with, a, with a, again, a slight preference when it's the you, it's the slightly outside voice questioning the I narrator. Mm -hmm. So that's what that back and forth is. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't even, again, it's hilarious how people say things and you're like, yes, I'm a genius. But like, no, I did not think about like, oh, I should put that right before the stage text. No, I did, um, you know, to, to project that. But yeah, I mean, 
love to say I did that on purpose, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Jane, goodbye. It was great to have you. I see you have to go, but thanks for coming. Oh, um, people are. Yeah, we're yeah, going to have to cut it. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. We can stay till 7 15 if folks have something to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks, Glenn. Yeah, good question. I'm glad it works. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, so. Mindy read says, wonderful me? reading, such a tapestry all these years, and we are still haunted by Plath. Yes, who she was could have been. I totally agree. Totally, totally agree. agree. I'm going to show you guys something. If you haven't read it yet, this is a genius biography that came out last year. It's massive. It's oh, called yeah. Red, Red Comet. Um, yeah. And it's by Heather Clark, and it totally depathologizes her. It to it just it's a beautiful take. Um, it's a massive tome, which she deserves, in my opinion. And it focuses so much on her actual writing. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm just I'm just literally like shilling this book because it never <laughs> I don't know Heather Clark, but I wish I did. Um, anyway, it's brilliant. So um, because I I think there's a re like there's a reason she so that she haunts us you know Mindy like I think she's so she was just it's like I, I didn't go we didn't go further into the stage text but I write about like how she killed herself right before um uh the feminine mystique showed up like literally she killed herself three months before that came out right it, I think it came out right in my round when I was born I think it was June 1963 I was born and so was the feminine mystique and my mother can attest to this the nurse said to my mother when I was born I'm sorry, it's a girl. A female uh, nurse said that to my mother when I was born. How nice. The first my mother for her part was glad I was female. Birth. Must be said. <laughs> I just thought, I'd, yeah, she's like, yes. Yeah, it's, it's good to have like, you know, your history monitor over the side. But um, yeah, yeah. But seriously, like that's the situation we were in. And then she was also in the UK, which is a whole other world and mood, which I could talk about. But being American and Britain is tricky yeah. old business. <laughs> you know, I I reread the Bell Jar when I was mm. starting this memoir about the breakdown, and that book is so ahead of its time. Oh my god! I mean, if someone published that book today, it would be word for word. It's so well done. It's so well crafted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's because we know that this is what happened to her at the time. I don't think anybody really knew that, you know, mm -hmm. novel, but the things that, um, and actually I did some research and I might even have it, um, on my, oh, I can't, I can't make a screenshot of it though. But, um, when she disappeared, her disappearance was in all the papers. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing and if you I found a graphic of all the headlines about her disappearance Smith girl disappears right and it right makes a beautiful piece of art it's really amazing because she was this you know she was this um this nice white girl you know Smith college girl nobody would have ever thought this would have happened but when you read the book you know, and, and granted this is um, a fictionalization, but her depths are as revealed in that book as they are in Ariel, I think. Oh, I agree. I love that book. I mean, I remember I read that book when I was 18 and it just blew my little mind right after I, gra you know, graduated from high school. And I just was yeah. like, I'd never yeah. read anything that felt like my whole life had felt my senior year in high school. Um, I, was on, I was on scholarship. Yeah, I was on scholarship at a very, very, very hoity-toity boarding school and, it, and autistic, undiagnosed, obviously. And just that, that just the way that everything she talked about in that, it was how I felt. I mean, except that I didn't end up being suicidal for reasons I still don't understand. But that just is never maybe the Norman Peel part. But like, <laughs> but like I, that never is seems like the right solution so it's, um, it's, it's that shock of it's the shock of recognition that I, I I think goes across many categories of young girls because I'm from a working class background neither of my parents went to high school my grandparents were immigrants they really didn't mm -hmm. speak English um, and when I read, you know, I was, you know, I grew up in back of the yards, which is in back of the stockyards in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a butcher mm -hmm. in, in the stockyards. And then he mm -hmm. had his 
worked in a butcher shop. But when I read that book, it was like, I don't yeah. you know, Smith College. I didn't know from Smith College. I didn't know what was going on. But it was like her feelings and the way she hide, you know, the way she sort of hid them and masked herself as this mm-hmm. normal put together girl, except for the part where she's attacked and she leaves the blood on her face when she comes home to her mother's house. I mean, I, you know, that could have been written by me. You know, it was like mm-hmm. there's something about that book that cuts across all these categories of class when you read it. It's really an amazing book. Well, she actually didn't come from she her getting dismissed was a big deal. I mean, it, it wasn't yeah. she didn't she was not to the manor born. I mean, her mother kept trying right. to get her to those places. And that was something I right. identified with, <clears throat> um, like the, you know, uh, like, oh, you know, just getting to, uh, you know, let, let me get her there. Let me get her there, you know, and trying very hard and, and with all the best intentions. But like, it's still that pressure and the feeling of I've got to I've got to be a dancing seal. I've got to be a dancing seal to stay here. I've got to be a dance, you know, and that mass. Masking, I think, again, for yeah. me, that would have been my entree, both the class part and the masking part and all of that. And I just want to just note there's some more things in the chat. Um, yeah. uh, M- M- Mindy said, a joy to hear the variable of class brought forward. Thank you. And listening to both of you through the lens of feminism, as well as revolutionary promises kept and yet to be fulfilled. Love Absolutely. That. And then I love what love Laura that. says, too. When you are reading the term, the body keeps the score, caused me to think of score as music, which, of course, gives it a new meaning. Again, hadn't thought of that. I'll just pretend I'm a genius. Um, thanks, <laughs> Laura. Because <laughs> uh, that's true, you know. And, and in fact, what I always say about my stage text is they have a musical logic, not a narrative logic. So, um, that's really interesting. There, isn't there a book? There's a book called The Bible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, yeah. That, that, a very important book. Yeah. Oh, here's Sharon, one from. You... Yes. She wrote a book out long. Oh, I'd like to read that. Yeah. Couldn't write, couldn't work. Went to a doc in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, I would like to read that. Yeah. Thank you for that recommendation. Hmm. Yeah. Or I couldn't work. The, the thing with me was when I had the breakdown, I actually forced myself to go into teach. And if anyone of you have ever been to AWP or you know what that yes. is, you will know just... how fucking insane it was yes. that I went to AWP in the yes, middle of this shit. Yes. But I want to say one thing. I went to AWP in the middle of this and um, I met someone who told me about this um, female poet, Eunice Odio. She was Costa Rican, but she lived in Mexico. And I learned about her and she was like the touchstone for this new poetry collection that I finished Mm -hmm. um, about all these underknown women uh, poets of the Americas who got pulled under by circumstances. And so I researched all of them and I wrote poems for all of them. And I'm really hoping there's a press that has this book now and I want them to bring it out and I'm so yeah. sent light a candle or something yeah, but yeah so on. even though I was in extremis and I went to AWP there was like this gift there so there you go yeah no I understand that because like when I was having my silent nervous breakdown in high school I did not oh I tried to go to a therapist for like two times and only once I was feeling somewhat better and the therapist said if that all happened to you, you had a hard childhood. And I was like, okay, great start. Not going <laughs> to. <Yeah. laughs> and so, um, you know, that didn't work out. Uh, and then, um, it, but, but I worked, I, I, theater is what I did. I, I actually write about this in the memoir. What, what saved me was theater. And I became a theater director, um, which was a beautiful way to mask. Cause you know, there's just all these other things. people what to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you create your own little world and you have a facsimile of a social life within, um, you know, w- within a very, very concrete structure. Uh, so that's that's kind of the theater really did save my ass when nobody else could. Yeah. Oh, pa- Pamela has a question. I have a question about productivity and disability. That's a good question all by itself. The expression is whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thanks, Nietzsche. I wonder, <laughs> there's your answer. That was Nietzsche. Look what happened to him. I wonder, do you feel that the issues we're discussing ultimately have fueled your work or made it harder? Good question. Who's what the do you, question for? From who's Pamela. The, I think so it's for who, both of us. It for both I think it's, of you, you start. What do you think? Um... 
Both exclamation oh. points. Three exclamation points, at least. Four or three. I felt <laughs> like it I felt like it was I felt like trying to work was like ripping myself apart, but I feel like I got over it faster because I went in to teach because when I would sit down in front of the class, mm -hmm. whatever I was doing would fall away and I would have to, you know, concentrate on 15 other people. And as soon as I left that room, it would just come rushing back. But I think the fact that I didn't sit around helped me get over it because I don't know if when you have a concussion, what medication can help that? I don't know. I mean, I think with certain mental states, you definitely need to take medication, but I don't know what, and especially with epilepsy, I don't know what medic, I was afraid of it because of the epilepsy. I did not know what medication would help, but I got over it. It took me three years and I was finally free of it. It was, it was the work. I hope to God never to go through it again. It was horrible. But I think the fact that I pushed maybe made me feel worse, but ultimately it was better. I have no idea. That's just my little answer. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you, Sharon. It's so funny because you said both, um, Pamela, meaning both of us to answer your question, I would say both as the answer to your question. So in other words, yeah. especially being autistic, now that I understand, well, I understand more about it than I did before. I've only known about it for a couple of years. So I'm not a world expert, but I am autistic. <laughs> so what I have, I have both sides. In other words, I, 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 one of the things about being autistic is you have a billion synapses going off all the time. And it's turning out, they're beginning to realize this is true of everyone, but most of them are silent as you get older. And, but with, with autistic people, they're on all the time, right? So it's like, la, 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 la. all right. So <laughs> what that creates is two things. One is when you're like, when I'm in perfect alignment, let's just say for lack of a better word. Okay. It allows me to see things and put things together that most people probably don't have easy access to, right? Because like they're all on. Now you put me, tilt me this way or that way. And then it's like freaking nightmare because it's like, what? You know, so it's one of the reasons I'm beginning to understand why I've always felt like a hothouse flower, you know, because it's like, if something goes wrong, I just tilts me so far off and I, I seem as a person and I can be, and I do think something about class and scholarships and things makes you into a kind of a person that does work through anything. At least if for me, if fear was a big thing. It's like, I must work through this. I must work through this. I must work through. So there's that, which I think is, you know, I have a lot of feelings about that one way and the other. And I do think there's some benefit to it. I also think fear yeah, exactly is a big driver. Um, but I also think what happens, at least I'm 59, about to turn 60, which still blows my mind. Um, and, you know, it, the, the adrenal situation there finally at some point just falls apart. Like that's for me, this is the, the wheels came off the cart. And, I, and in my case, it led to my autism diagnosis, which has turned out to be a big liberation. But so to answer your question, I really think, and yet one of the things that's also, this isn't so much about work, but something I'm writing about in my memoir and trying to find the right way to, to write about it is there was a situation I was in when I was 10, weirdly considering what you wrote in your, your piece, it was very strange, but a, a very weird woman who was, took care of me and I was in a lot of danger. And I've framed it one way for a long, a long time, and, and it had to do with a certain level of inadequacy or whatever. And now I'm looking at it and I'm like, holy crap. Well, A, I've changed a long time ago and that I realized, oh, you survived. That's good. But I realized not only did I survive out of luck or whatever, but I survived because I'm autistic. And this is what I mean. I'm hyper, I'm hyper empathetic. And there's, there's two kinds of autistic people. There's ones with no empathy and there's ones with what's called hyper empathy. And it's like you literally see from the other person's point of view. And, and it, it's very confusing because sometimes you don't know what point of view you're even seeing from or feeling. It's an affective empathy, right? So I knew what she was up to. Like, in other words, so I I was able to trace this woman and do what needed to get done to survive that situation. Now, no 10-year-old should have to do that. But I did. And I think I survived because I'm autistic, oddly enough. I also think she targeted me because I'm autistic. But 
I also feel like I survived because of it. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's another example of the paradox that uh, one of the things that no therapist has ever been able to understand that I've told the story to, especially my trauma therapist, is how was it that you didn't switch? In other words, I guess when people are with somebody with that level of um, a psychopathology, that a kid or any somebody sort of trapped, which I was, they tend to break kind of, I guess, a Stockholm thing or whatever. I didn't. And mm-hmm. she was like, how did you not? Switch? And I realized because as an autistic person, your sense of reality is like this. And it sounds like a paradox. I'm not saying I had the empathy, but that's because I knew how to react. But I also knew the whole time that I was me and she was her and she was insane and and that she was losing her mind. And somehow I knew that like and and that's and honestly, I don't know if a quote normal kid would have figured that out. Mm-hmm. Maybe they would have. I don't know. Or maybe they just would have told somebody at school and it wouldn't have been. But like, but like I was just trying to figure out how to survive the situation. So. So I don't yeah, know if that answers your question, Pam. Pamela. Do Pam or Pamela? I always forget Pamela, right? You don't care. Pam. It's great to see you here, though. I don't know, Sharon, if you want to add anything to that. Or... No, I mean, no. I mean, I, 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 I put in the chat paradox and precarity, but that's kind of you know, like getting in the interstices where other people can't fit. You know what I mean? I think it's that's kind of, um, it's not a superpower, but it's a power. And I think well, once you realize it and you can handle it, you know, it helps. And you, ha- and you have to realize it comes, you know, if you ever, if you see, if anyone's seen the new uh, Star Trek series, The Mandalorian, and there's oh, yes. Gro- Groglu, the little the little Yoda guy, you yes. know, he like does this superpower thing and then he goes clunk and he falls asleep. <laughs> and that's yeah. of, like, I'm like, I relate to that. I don't, I mean, I'm not that I, I can do telekinesis, but I relate to the, like, I'm doing all these things, ugh, you know, and it's just like, and I need to know, like, that's the other thing I need to know is like when to go to fucking sleep, which is not the easiest thing either for me or most autistic people either. Audrey, Audrey wrote in the chat. I remember hearing an autistic woman say that she was able to fly with the rain. Oh my God. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. I kind of understand that in a weird way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and yeah, so it's been, uh, so anyway, we're at 715. So Sharon, do you want to yeah. say any final words, any something bits of humor so and or wisdom? Yes, just, definitely. Okay, a very short it. poem. Excellent. Only, I'm so excited. It's very short. It's only one go. page. Oh, so this is, this is from um, the manuscript that I just talked about. It's called Even Living Makes Me Die. And it's dedicated to 25 underknown women poets of the America. So I researched their work and I sat with them and their work and I looked at their pictures. And some of these women are not so underknown, but to mainstream poetry, they are, they're not known as well as they should be. And most of them had horrible lives. Um, the woman who th- that this poem is after is Julia de Burgos, and she was born in Puerto Rico in 1917, and she literally died on the street in Harlem in 1953. I'm not kidding. She passed out and was dead on the street and was in the hospital for three days before anybody knew who she was. So um, what I did was I researched her, and she has a poem called To Julia de Burgos, To Herself. So I took the, um, I didn't take any lines from the poem, but I took the rhythm of the poem and I wrote a poem of her talking to me about writing about her. So this is called To Sharon Mesmer after Julia de Burgos. This poem was not written by you, Sharon Mesmer, white woman whose name means complainer of insomnia. This poem was written by me, Julia de Burgos, whose name means my eyes are filled with the graves of stars, and that's why I can fly. Who am I? Don't you know me? Well, when God asked me who I wanted to be, and I said, someone who loves peacefully, God wrote down amnesiac and pushed me out of baby heaven like a blank, pushes a blank out of a blank. Fill in the blanks, Sharon Mesmer. I've already done all the work. What, you're still wondering how I got inside? Still wondering why only one of us can fly? 
Well, keep in mind that when you write a line like, no one loved me, but I had wings, we both know you're trying to sound like Mary Oliver. I know because I never tried to write myself into a position involving career advancement or even happiness. I am no mere witness to inertia. I know that heaven kills and hell transforms a witness to inertia into an embodied form of joy for all eternity. At the same time, I'm no angel. I'm not even a filthy pigeon. What am I then? I am the scaled fish writhing, still alive in your hands. My wild eyes pleading with you to blank. You know what to do. Start with feeling the constrictions of your sticky wings. Oh, what a great way to stop. That's wonderful. I'm going to stop the recording now so anyone who's listening to it gets to end with that and gets oh, thank to you. hear that. Hold on one second.